It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Good morning, Speaker. Uh, this government didn't campaign on a plan to sell off our public health care system. At no point during the campaign did they say they were going to bring in two-tier health care. That's why on Friday and Saturday, hundreds of thousands of Ontarians voted in the Ontario Health Coalition's citizen-run referendum to keep our health care system public. People are making their voices heard because of overwhelming evidence, Speaker, from many other provinces that the government's plan will worsen services for patients and cost so much more. Speaker, to the Premier, will his government listen to the people of Ontario and reverse course on their plans to sell off our public health care system? To reply, the Premier. Well, through you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that question. I, I don't call it a referendum. It was a political poll driven one side. But in saying that, Mr. Speaker, because we do our, our polling too, you know, right now, and I'm going to include the, the Liberals, through many years, we've compiled over 800 community surgical diagnostic centers that are operating right now in the province. What we're doing, we're expanding it. And the poll should be very, very simple. This is the way the poll should be, is do you want to wait in line for a hip replacement for 18 months, or would you like to get something done in 60 days from the exact same doctor, the exact same doctor in, in a surgical clinic, in, in a center, and get out in two or three months. We had the opportunity, to my, myself and the Minister of Health, we went to Kensington Health. What a phenomenal facility that is. I'm just wondering if the NDP wants to close Kensington Health doing 12,000 cataract operations a year. That's the question of the NDP, yeah. because it'd be a disaster if we ever close Kensington Health and cancel 12,000 cataract operations. That's what they want. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. It's apples and oranges, and the, and the Premier knows that. This government's plan for health care are seeing emergency rooms in smaller and rural communities across the province close for hours, for days, or even permanently. Last week, I joined residents in Minden as they rallied desperately to save their local emergency room. Uh, it's set to close permanently this Wednesday. They're worried, Speaker, as anyone would be, if the emergency room they relied on was shut down and they were forced to leave their community in a time of crisis. Back to the Premier, how many communities will see emergency rooms close this summer because of this government's failure to act? And to reply, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. The, the NDP are satisfied with the status quo. I can tell you that our government is not. We have made many different investments that, to quote Anthony Dale, the president of the Ontario Hospitals Association, quote, we're rushing to make up for the lost time and the government has implemented a wide range of well-designed and very constructive programs to recruit and retrain to incent health care workers, and especially nurses, to consider practicing in rural and remote communities. We're making that effort, we're making those investments, and we will continue to do that because we understand as Ontario grows, we need to continue to make the investment in health care. A health care budget that I might add is over $80 billion in the province of Ontario. We are investing, we are ensuring that people who want to practice in the Spons? province of Ontario have that right through many different programs. The final supplementary. Speaker, Speaker, it's working so well that the emergency rooms are closing. That's what's happening under this government's watch five years in, and it's not just Minden, Speaker. Chesley, Walkerton, Seaforth, Alexandria, Clinton, Perth, Campbellford. The ER in Thessalon announced this morning that it would be closed again today due to staffing shortages. Speaker, this community has been without a primary care doctor for two years, and now they're going to have to drive 40 minutes to an emergency room. While you're busy trying to take more staff out of our system and move them into private for-profit clinics, the solution is simple. Invest in the staff we need to keep those emergency rooms open. So to the Premier, what will he do today? to make sure that Question. this closure in Thessalon is the last ER closure Ontarians will see this summer. Members, so please take your seat. Minister of Health. 
Speaker, it's not what we're doing today, it's what we have already started. And that was, for example, a learn and stay program that allows three critically important health care uh, pathways, the lab technicians, the nurses, the paramedics, who are willing to train in communities that are underserved, have their tuition and books covered if they agree to stay on for an additional two years. We have now in the province of Ontario, first across Canada, as of right rules under Bill 60, which means that an individual clinician doctor, nurse who wants to practice in the province of Ontario can do so today instead of waiting months to get that um, qualification happening for the college. We directed the College of Nurses and the, the uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario to quickly deal Response. with the backlog that had individual, educated, uh, trained people who are waiting for those licensures. We now have, and we saw, a historic number of nurses who were able to, pa to pack into that program will continue. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll move to the next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. This question is for the Minister of Transportation. A 2018 report by the Auditor General revealed serious problems with the construction of the Eglinton Crosstown and the public-private partnership set up to build it. The Minister could have acted to fix these problems, but two years later, a follow-up report said, quote, no improvements had occurred. In fact, the problems had gotten even worse. The P3 contractor was building at risk, which means the safety of these designs had not been confirmed. It suggests that the deficiencies with the Eglinton Crosstown could be much more serious than the public's been told. So, Speaker, why did the minister ignore the problems with the Eglinton Crosstown? To reply, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for the question, but it is so ironic to hear the Leader and members opposite ask about problems uh, that are faced uh, with the Eglinton Crosstown, because we brought forward a bill to this House in 2020 to address a lot of the problems related to the, 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 a lot of those delays that were created that we saw on the Eglinton Crosstown, Mr. Speaker. It was a bill called the Building Transit Faster Act, Mr. Speaker. It couldn't have been more clear what the intention of that bill was. And what did the opposition do, Mr. Speaker? They voted against it. So for the Leader of the Opposition Order. to stand in this House Order. and ask why we're not building transit faster, I would ask her, why did they vote against that important piece of legislation so that we can avoid a lot of the problems with the Eglinton Crosstown, get shovels in the ground faster, and build the transit that the City of Toronto Response. and North Region and Hamilton deserve? Supplementary question. Needs to follow along here. They passed their bill and we are in this situation. It's done nothing. <laughs> transit, Speaker, transit P3s in the United Kingdom experienced repeated lawsuits, insolvencies, and bailouts. A £30 billion P3 scheme to upgrade the London Underground fell apart. Costly P3 failures like this are why the UK's Conservative government abandoned P3 contracts altogether in 2018. Now Ontario is running into the same costly delays, overruns and deficiencies. If the Eglinton Crosstown P3 contractor doesn't get another public bailout, are we going to see the whole thing collapse just like what happened in the UK? Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the Leader of the Opposition is asking me to follow along, and with all due respect, Mr. Speaker, I would ask her to follow along. We passed the bill because of the majority that we have, despite their voting against it, in 2020. And what have we seen? In 2019, the Premier pr introduced the most ambitious public transit expansion plan anywhere in North America. And since then, Mr. Speaker, we've seen shovels in the ground on the new Ontario line a line they voted against. Yes. We have seen significant progress on tunneling on the Eglinton Crosstown West Extension, Mr. Speaker. The tunnel is halfway done. On Scarborough, Mr. Speaker, we've seen significant progress on the Scarborough Subway Extension, Mr. Speaker. And just a few weeks ago, we announced the RFQ for the Young North Subway Extension. They claim to believe and to, to stand up for transit riders and for the people of the City of Toronto and York Region and Hamilton, Mr. Speaker. But at the end of the day, the Leader of the Opposition and her party 
always vote against it. Sure. The final supplementary. This is outrageous, Speaker. This minister needs to demonstrate that she is focused on protecting Order. the interests Order. of the public and the transit riders and not the interests of private contractors and political insiders. And yet this minister has stacked the Metrolinx board with cronies, including former Conservative politicians and fundraisers. Her latest appointee is Mark McQueen the private financier who gave the minister her first big job in Canada and has donated thousands of dollars to her and to the Conservative Party. Confidence in Metrolinx and the minister are at an all-time low. So, Speaker, to the minister, why is she appointing her friends to the Metrolinx board instead of fixing the problems with the Eglinton Crosstown? Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What, what's truly outrageous is to hear the Leader of the Opposition stand here and pretend to be standing up for transit riders while, during the height of the pandemic, our government brought forward with the federal government the Safe Restart Agreement to provide billions of dollars to keep our essential public transit running throughout the pandemic to get our essential workers Order. to and from work. Order. Mr. Speaker, $1.5 billion to the TTC alone. $2.1 billion Order. to public transit systems across the province of Ontario. But you know what the NDP did, Mr. Speaker? Yeah, we they voted against it. Oh. If they had had their way, Mr. Speaker, we would have shut, had to shut down the TTC. We would Order. have had to shut down OC Transpo. We would have had to shut down municipal transit systems across the province. But thanks to the leadership of our Premier and our Spons. government, Mr. Speaker, we put forward substantial funding to keep public transit going. We're building public transit, Mr. Speaker. We are supporting it. Order. Stop the clock. I'll remind the House I need to be able to hear the member who has the floor, and the interjections are always out of order. The next question, start the clock, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, back to the Transportation Minister. Sixteen months ago, the Transportation Minister said she would investigate consultant Brian Guest and his firm Boxfish. Mr. Guest, Speaker, was a key advisor to Ottawa's LRT, a former vice president of Metrolinx, and a key leader in most of Toronto's LRT contracts, including the Eglinton Crosstown. Boxfish earned millions for contracts in LRT systems that are failing or don't work. The minister at the time said, quote, she was extremely concerned about any perceived or potential conflict of interest with Mr. Guest and pledged to investigate him and Boxfish. But, Speaker, we've done our own investigation and we have confirmed Mr. Guest has never been investigated. Neither has Boxfish. So if the Minister of Transportation was truly extremely concerned, why did she break her promise to this House and the people of Ontario and fail to investigate Mr. Order. Guest or Boxfish for any of these contracts? To reply, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, we conducted an internal investigation and determined um, that the uh, consultancy that was being provided, consultancy work that was being provided by Boxfish, needed to come to an end, which it did at Metrolinx, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, that member opposite knows full well how important it is to make sure that people who are building a transit system have the time to make sure they do it right. That's why our government called a public inquiry into what happened at the Ottawa LRT. And that's why learning the lessons that Justice Horrigan put forth in his report on the problems that plague the Ottawa LRT, our government is determined to make sure that with respect to the Crosstown, we do it right, and we make sure that we build this system properly, that it is safe for transit riders, that it's safe for transit operators, and it will Response. open when it is safe for all. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary, back to the member for Ottawa. Back to the Transportation Minister. It's confusing for the opposition. When we do our own freedom of information search, Speaker, Order. when we do our own freedom Order. of information search and we ask specifically, has an investigation been done into Mr. Guest and Boxfish, and the minister's assistants get back to us with a no, 
and we're told in this House that somehow an investigation has happened. Is the minister prepared to make that investigation public? Because this firm, Boxfish, has worked on the Eglinton Crosstown, worked on stage one of Ottawa's struggling LRT, and all we know to date from publicly available information we have asked for and received is that nothing has happened. So very clearly to the minister, the investigations that she claims to have done, will you make that internal investigation public? Will accountability be brought to Eglinton Crosstown, to stage one of Ottawa's LRT, and every Question. other transit project being done under this government? Members will please take their seats. To reply, the Minister of Transportation. The member opposite talks about what's confusing. I think what's confusing uh, would be confusing for the, his constituents in Ottawa would be to find out that he voted against the safe restart funding that we provided to the Ottawa transit system. Order. Year after year after year during the Order. pandemic, our government put forward millions and millions of dollars to make sure that the Ottawa transit system could continue to run for his Order. residents, for his constituents, for the essential workers who are taking care of us during the pandemic. We put that money forward, Mr. Speaker, and when the member opposite had a real chance to support public transit in his riding and in his city, that he stands up here and talks about defending, Mr. Speaker, he voted against it. And I think that is what is very confusing, and he, should owe, he owes an answer to his constituents for why he did so, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Markham Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Great minister. Last week, the minister was in Germany again to continue meeting with an, with an attracting investment in the automotive and EV sectors. With the recent news, the Volkswagen coming to Ontario, there is no question that the province should continue to focus on its manufacturing capabilities and ensure that there are good jobs for families across the province now and into the future. Speaker, can the minister please provide us with an update on his recent trade mission to the Germany? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now that's a good question. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, the uh, mission to Germany was an opportunity to build on the $25 billion in auto and EV investments that we've landed in Ontario in the last two and a half years. We were able to, <laughs> we were able to thank the Volkswagen team who we worked with day to day to land this historic $7 billion investment here in Ontario. But it was an opportunity to discuss the nature of the main suppliers they now need to begin operations. Cathode, anode, separator, copper foil, electrolyte, lithium hydroxide. Speaker, these aren't just words. Each of those are main components needed in a battery, and each of those represents a one to three billion dollar company Response. coming here to Ontario. Speaker, we're also talking about a supplier's day to help identify opportunities for their new facility in St. Thomas. Supplementary, back to the member for Markham Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for the great response. It sounds like the trade mission is comes at critical time in Ontario automotive and EV journey. The future of transportation is shifting towards electrification and with the comes with renewed focus on clean technology. Ontario must continue to promote itself as a great place to do business, but beyond that, it must promote itself as a leading jurisdiction in the EV revolution. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how companies overseas feel about investing in Ontario and what they see our competitive, competitive edge to be? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Economic development. Germany, we also met with Mercedes-Benz and many EV parts companies to promote Ontario as a destination of choice. Of note were Aer Klinger and Eberspecker Group. Now, Aer Klinger currently operates a manufacturing facility here in Leamington, and Eberspecker has facilities in Mississauga and Concord. We also took a day trip to Poland to meet with similar type companies, and what we heard everywhere was consistent. In this turmoil-filled world, 
post-pandemic, Russia invasion, Chinese-dominated supply chains, they all look at Ontario as a sea of calm, a stable, reliable, trusted partner. And they also view Ontario as a safe jurisdiction, safe for their employees, safe for their families, safe for their executives to visit. We showed them that Ontario is all that and more. Thank you. The next question, the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. A few weeks ago, the NDP and I presented evidence of cash for access culture in minor hockey that is letting rich parents buy their children spots and teams, shutting out talented young athletes in the process. Evidence of not-for-profit teams being bought and sold for millions in private profits. The Minister of Sports shrugged his shoulders. Since then, a whistleblower provided the minister with new evidence of this widespread corruption, financial documents and communique that suggested this is happening at every level. You know what they heard back from the minister? Nothing. My question is to the Minister of Sports and Tourism. How much more evidence of corruption does he need before he takes complete action? Good question. To reply, Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good, good morning to everyone. Uh, I, I thank the member opposite for the question. Uh, I've been in contact <clears throat> excuse me, with the members of the GTHL, and we have discussed uh, what the ongoing investigation that is happening that if something is exposed with respect to wrongdoing dollars or whatever that we will be brought we as in our ministry will be brought up to speed Mr. Speaker the one thing I don't want to get caught up into is speculation someone says one thing and another someone says something else let's like everything else get the facts of what's going on Mr. Facts. Speaker and when we get the facts we will respond but only until we have the facts and the information then we can make good decisions. Supplementary questions. Thank you, Speaker. Last week, the whistleblower sent information to both our offices, and it seems to me that's quite a bit of fact on those papers. Here, 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 I'm willing here. to send it back over to the minister if he'd like. Yes. Speaker, I don't buy it. The minister says an independent investigation is underway, but is akin to the GTHL investigation itself. The minister says he has, quote, no authority. Speaker, that is not accurate at all. His ministry regulates provincial sports organizations. The Ontario Hockey Federation is that organization. The G GTHL is its member. The ministry requires these organizations to verify annually that they meet the requirements for this special status. Speaker, the puck is supposed to stop with the Minister of Sports. So back to him. Question. When will the Minister of Sports do his job and take responsibility by launching an actual investigation to stop this corruption? Again, to reply, Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sports. Well, thanks again for the question. And, uh, the ministry does not have a direct relationship with the member organizations of the PSOs and has no authority over their operations. The, the GTHL is a member of the Ontario Hockey Federation. And I think you know that, uh, or she knows that, Mr. Speaker, and because uh, the member opposite is well versed of what's going on. But again, when we talk about an independent investigation, um, I don't believe I've received a phone call back from those that are doing the investigation or the GTHL with their findings. And once again, I know there's conversations that go around. It is sport, Mr. Speaker, and everyone has an opinion. But I'd rather respond and act on results and specific information before we would get involved with the PSOs and help sort this out. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Peterborough, Kawartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Okay, Individuals and families, and even businesses in my community, as well as all across Ontario, are looking for relief on their energy bills. They are. When our government was first elected in 2018, we made a commitment to make life more affordable for the people of Ontario. We have to make every effort to deliver on our commitment, and we need to be providing more ways for Ontarians to take control of their energy bills and encourage energy conservation. 
Under the previous Liberal government, Ontario witnessed out-of-control energy costs as a result of their failed policies. Shame. The people of Ontario expect our government to do all that we can do to reduce these costs. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is providing support to the people of Ontario in helping them save on their energy bills? Good question. <laughs> to reply, the Minister of Energy. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and congratulations to the member opposite on his Peterborough Peets winning the OHL championship last week. As usual, the member is correct, Mr. Speaker. I know from my time as a critic on that side, uh, Ontarians felt helpless as they watched their hydro bills just skyrocket on a monthly basis. Then in 2018, we took office, Mr. Speaker. We began taking steps to reduce the costs and empower customers to lower their costs. We implemented the Ontario Electricity Rebate, the OER, which is lowering the cost of electricity by 12%. Mr. Speaker, we introduced more customer choice. We gave customers the power to take control of their hydro bills, with green button standard being implemented right across, possibly saving customers up to 18 per cent. Electricity customers also will soon have the right, and they do in some jurisdictions, to have an ultra low overnight rate, Mr. Speaker. And I'm going to have more to say about the Peak Perks program coming up in my supplementary order. Order. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know the member from Ottawa South doesn't want to hear these things, but when I was out canvassing in 2018, in the rural part of my riding, frequently I heard about people who had to make the decision between heating and eating, that's and that's true. just not acceptable. That's right. It's encouraging to hear about the many different energy initiatives and supports brought forward by our government to help Ontario's hardworking families and businesses. However, affordable energy remains a serious issue for our province. That's true. Our government must continue to implement solutions that will bring costs down and provide help to Ontarians after the previous Liberal government squandered our province's clean energy advantage. Shame. Our government must continue to show respect for the people of Ontario by implementing programs that offer choice and will help to reduce costs. Speaker, can the minister please share more details about the recent announced peak perks Question. energy program and how this will benefit the people of Ontario. Minister of Energy. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, I wouldn't say it three times fast, but the Peak Perks program is an energy efficiency program that means families have a, yet another tool to help them with their energy bills. Families are going to receive a $75 uh, financial incentive this year for lowering their energy use at peak times, and they can receive it in future years as well if they remain in the program, a $20 incentive. And that's good for families, and it's really good for our grid. And this new program, you know, it's funny hearing the members opposite scoff because during their time, Mr. Speaker, electricity prices Order. were soaring. These folks are afraid Order. of giving people control of their electricity bills because they can save money. The Liberals and everybody remembers what the Liberals did to energy costs in this province. And I can't believe when Premier Kathleen Wynne said Order. it was the biggest mistake that she made Response. during her time here as the Premier that they're still defending it, Mr. Speaker, and they will still defend it. We're bringing in. And electricity. Restart the clock. Member for Timiskaming Cochrane. Thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Bill 97 will allow three severed residential lots per farm property. This could severely limit livestock expansion because of MDS guidelines. In response to my question a few weeks ago, the minister stated that, and I quote, we have taken a, long, a, we have taken a thoughtful approach and we are going to be okay. Since then, Ontario farmers have united to stand in strong opposition to the proposed severances. Beef farmers, Ontario pork, dairy farmers, chicken farmers, OFA, CFFO, NFU, and others. These are the people who feed our cities. That's right. And they're telling you, this is a mistake. Will you remove the ag severance provisions from Bill 97? <laughs> to respond, I recognize the Associate Minister of Housing. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker. The NDP continues to spread misinformation about our government's balanced and thoughtful proposal. Well, and conclude her answer. 
Our government has a balanced and thoughtful proposal that is still open for public consultation. As we previously stated, our goal has always been to support farmers, their families and agricultural workers by increasing the supply of homes near the place of work. That is why we've put forward for consultation a thoughtful draft proposal that would establish specific criteria to allow farmers the voluntary option of adding additional residential lots to their own land. The government intends to extend the commenting period on the Environmental Registry of Ontario beyond the original closing date of June 5th. This will give the public a greater Lots. opportunity to comment on these proposals and will give our government more time to consider alternative solutions to support multi-generational farm families while addressing the concerns that have been raised over the current Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I sincerely hope the government does reconsider because the issue that they have missed, there is no problem for a farm putting more residences on the farmstead itself. The problem is that's not, and everyone's, everyone's in agreement about that. The problem is when you sever a lot, and I've had to do it on my own farm. I had to buy the neighbor's house so I could actually expand my farm. And that's going to happen over and over again if we don't fix it. So I am encouraged that you're willing to reconsider. I hope that the Premier does reconsider and fix 97 so that livestock, livestock operations aren't restricted when they try to expand. Thank you. Premier. Well, th thank you for the question, and this is going to be one of the times that we, we all kind of agree, including the farmers, we do. So we had a great, great meeting with all the farmers on, on Friday and, and came up with a solution about the severance, but the number one complaint that I, I get when I go to the farms, I want my kids to stay on the farm, and there is, there is certain jurisdictions that won't allow you to build a, an additional residence. The other number one complaint is, and I heard it this morning from a farmer, what I spoke to on the way down here, he has a hundred migrant workers that work on the farm that are critical to his operation, but he has no place to put them. But we're going to come up with a happy compromise and, and work with the farmers because they're the ones that uh, have to live with us day in and day out. So we're kind of, we're, believe it or not, we're, we're all, uh, John, I'm sorry, I shouldn't call him John, uh, the member, uh, we're, we're all kind of on the same page here. We're going to work with them. But they did say one thing, Mr. Speaker. They said there's no government in the history of this province that supported their farmers more than this government, and they appreciate it. So come to order. The next question, start the clock. Member for Don Valley East. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health. Just over two months ago, I tabled my private member's bill to address the most predatory hiring and recruitment practices used by temporary nursing agencies, while also establishing a safe and responsible licensing framework. Mere days after I tabled this legislation, the Minister of Long-Term Care stated that he would form a technical advisory committee to examine the issue of price gouging by nursing agencies. But since then, it's been radio silence. Instead, all we've heard is a cry for help from hospitals and health care workers in response to legislation like Bill 124 and a worsening lack of government support. This kind of public policy makes the tragic situation in Minden inevitable. And now this government is doing what it does best. It's looking the other way. It's washing its hands of the Minden Hospital, and it's washing its hands of our health care system. Why? So that temporary nursing agencies can profit? So that private for-profit clinics Jen? can turn a profit? This government is an expert in looking the other way, Mr. Speaker. When will the Minister of Health stop looking the other way and look at the mess she's made of Minden and Ontario's health care? Okay. The reply, Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, while the member 
um, opposite continues to defend the status quo. We are not satisfied with the status quo here, which is why we have made so many different investments that are ensuring we have health human resources available across Ontario. You know, we are experiencing challenges, as is all Canadian jurisdictions, in ensuring that we have sufficient uh, staffing. But we are doing that with investments. Two new medical schools in the province of Ontario. We have never seen this kind of investment in training, in retaining, in keeping and giving people the opportunity to practice in medicine than we have in the province of Ontario. And I might remind the member opposite that it was actually Kathleen Wynne in her major uh, exit interview after she was defeated talked about the regret that she had in terms of cutting residency Response. positions for uh, physicians and, in fact, not sufficiently supporting the health care system. We're making the investments. We're doing that work. It's Thank you. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You'll have to forgive me, but it's the same hollow talking points from the Minister of Health. When I was in Minden last Sunday, I was told of how temporary nursing agencies came to the region and picked hospitals clean of their staff. Patients rely on local emergency departments in times of crisis. This isn't about, Linden. This isn't about Minden. It's about the 2.2 million Ontarians who don't have access to a family doctor, who are forced to rely on emergency rooms as their only source of primary care. This government claims hospital closures are not their jurisdiction. Well, the green belt wasn't supposed to be their jurisdiction either, but somehow this government finds a way to get Order. what it wants. If they wanted to Order. keep local hospitals open, they would. Solving emergency room closures would mean paying healthcare workers a fair wage. It would mean telling private, for-profit interests to rein it in, but they won't. Mr. Speaker, I know this government loves saying yes to corporate interests, but just for once, for the sake of patients, not profits, will this government say no to the most predatory practices of temporary nursing agencies? Of health. As the member opposite talks about the need for investments, he actually voted against Bill 60. What would Bill 60 do? It actually ensures that people have as of right. So clinicians who are practicing in other Canadian jurisdictions for the first time in Canada are going to be able to start working immediately in Ontario as they get that license approved through the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario. You know, it is very challenging for me to listen to this information while we make the investments and they continue to continuously vote against those same investments. I don't understand how you cannot make the connection as a physician to understand as of right in the province of Ontario Order. is going to increase the capacity. Ensuring the College of Physicians and Surgeons immediately access, approve and Response. ultimately assess, give licenses to internationally educated and trained physicians. Those are the changes that we are making that could have been done under the previous Liberal government, but never. Thank you. The next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. First, I would like to thank the Associate Minister, along with the Minister of Housing, for visiting Ottawa last week. Everyone deserves to have a safe place to call home. That's why it's so crucial that our government addresses the need for more supportive housing across our province. We made a commitment to support Ontarians who are at risk of and those who are experiencing homelessness. As we work towards increasing housing supply across our province in the coming years, we must ensure that every Ontarian can find housing that meets their needs and budget. Speaker, through you, can the Associate Minister please elaborate on the measures our government is taking to increase the supply of affordable housing? Thank you. Question. The Associate Minister of Housing. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the great member from Carlton for the question. Our province is committed to tackling homelessness and ending the housing supply crisis in Ontario. Speaker, last week I was pleased to announce that our government is investing an additional $24.1 million to create more affordable housing in Ottawa. The 138 new affordable and supportive units resulting from this funding are being built even as we speak. 
and I had the opportunity to tour the site last week along with the member from Carlton, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, and His Worship, the Mayor of Ottawa. Speaker, this is a great example of how we will continue working with all of our partners across this province to make sure the most vulnerable people in our society are safe and homed. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's encouraging to see how our government is investing in affordable and supportive housing in Ottawa. This funding is vital in providing safe and secure homes for individuals and families in my community of Carleton and across the city of Ottawa. We know that homelessness is a serious concern throughout our province, and that's why our government must continue to provide solutions that address and prevent homelessness in Ottawa and across Ontario. Mr. Speaker, through you, can the Associate Minister please expand on the measures our government is taking to assist municipalities as they support the most vulnerable people in our communities? That's thank you. Associate Minister of Housing. Thank you, Speaker. Once again, thank you to the member. Everyone deserves a safe and affordable place to call home, and I'm proud of the work this government is doing to create a better future for all Ontarians. I look forward to seeing the positive impact these new affordable homes will have on the lives of so many in Ottawa. As I previously mentioned, we're committed to helping all of our municipal partners in their fight against homelessness. That is why our government has increased funding for the Homelessness Prevention Program and Indigenous Supportive Housing Programs by a historic $202 million. We will continue working to ensure our municipal partners have the tools they need to protect vulnerable members of their communities, because we know that when communities thrive, Ontario thrives. Thank you. The next question, the member for Nickelbelt. Thank you, Speaker, and happy World No Tobacco Week, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Tobacco is the leading cause of disease and death in Ontario. Tobacco is responsible for the death of 16,000 Ontarians every year and costs our health care system $2.2 billion. The tobacco industry has caused this epidemic. The time has come for big tobacco to pay for the harm that they have inflicted. All provinces, including Ontario, are in, presently in a settlement negotiation with three major tobacco companies. But healthcare organizations with us today, including Canadian Cancer Society, Heart and Stroke, and the Lung Associations, have not been consulted at all. They are appealing to the government to adopt the reasonable measure included in their open letter to the Premier as part of a potential settlement. Will the government guarantee that public health measures will be included in any agreement? Thank you, Speaker. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Appreciate the question from the member opposite. Of course, we have been uh, working uh, uh, very closely to ensure that uh, there is uh, maximum accountability with respect to uh, to, uh, to the the harm done to the people of the province of Ontario. And we'll continue to do that. Uh, at the same time, Mr. Speaker, I know that the, the Minister of Health, uh, uh, as well as uh, as a number of colleagues on both sides of the house, frankly, have been working to ensure that uh, not only young Canadians but Ontarians in general understand the uh, the challenges. Uh, uh, and the risks associated with uh, uh, with, uh, with with cigarette smoking and, uh, and tobacco use, uh, but uh, specifically to the member's question, officer, we'll continue to work very very closely with our partners to ensure the uh, the best possible outcome for the people of the province of Ontario. Thank you. The supplementary question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you very much, Speaker. The Minister of Long Term Care. Uh, has said that their, their government is working very closely with those stakeholders, but they haven't even consulted them, so hard to imagine that that's actually happened. Speaker, to the Premier, over the past five years, beyond a few measures on vaping already implemented elsewhere in Canada, this Conservative government has not implemented a single new tobacco control legislation or regulation. The Ontario health care crisis is real. By the end of question period, Speaker, two more people will die from this disease from the use of tobacco. This happens every single hour. This government can do more to curb tobacco use. They can do more to prevent addictions. They can do more to end disease and death. In Canada, there are five, there's $500 billion in lawsuits at stake, $500 billion in lawsuits. 
It's time that the big tobacco industry is held accountable. Question. It's time to make them pay. Will the Premier and the Conservative government finally prioritize this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to protect future generations of Ontarians from the harms, the disease and death caused by tobacco addiction and use? Again, the government has said it. Yes, Mr. Speaker, because that's what we have been doing right from the start, Mr. Speaker, whether it's with respect to this particular uh, uh, lawsuit. But how can the member suggest that any Ontario government or any member of this place has not been focused on ensuring that people understand the risks associated with cigarette smoking and tobacco use, Mr. Speaker? This isn't something that just the member has ownership of. In fact, I would ask the member to take a look at what, what a number of parliaments have done to reduce the use of tobacco, to make it harder for people to access it. Ontario has literally led the way, and we have done that, Mr. Speaker, not by working in isolation, but all parliaments, all members for decades in this place, Mr. Speaker, so I would ask the member to maybe take a moment to look at the success not only of the Bob Ray government, of the Liberal governments, of the Conservative governments. Spons. We have all done our part, Mr. Speaker. It's not her ownership. We've all done our part, and I'm very proud of what Ontario parliaments have done to ensure that the people of the province of Ontario are safe. Thank you. The next question, the member for Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Reduction. Small businesses are crucial to Ontario's economy and their success, and their accomplishments are felt in all communities across the province. Unfortunately, many of them bear the burden of excessive Order. regulation that prevents them from further growth. Ontario business owners want regulations that are easier to understand, faster to implement, and less costly to comply with. That is why our government must continue to help people and businesses to save time and resources by reducing red tape, which will encourage new investments. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is paving the way for better services and helping small businesses grow? Parliamentary Assistant and Member for Niagara West. Thank you very much uh, to the member for Cambridge for that question. During the 15 years of the former Liberal government propped up by the NDP, we saw job-killing regulation after job-killing regulation brought into this chamber. It led to 300,000 manufacturing jobs leaving this province. But under the leadership of this Premier and this government, we're taking a different approach. Today, we started third reading of the Less Red Tape, Stronger Economy Act, which will build Ontario's businesses by cutting red tape. The Liberals and NDP like left businesses in places like Niagara and across small communities in this riding without help when it came to accessing the broadband infrastructure they deserve. But by removing red tape, our government is getting the job done. We're making that process faster and ensuring that communities like those in Cambridge, like mine in Niagara West, are receiving the services they deserve when and where they need them. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that response. No one except the Liberals and the NDP members want more red tape in our province. That's right. By reducing unnecessary regulation burdens on our government can create an environment that drives new investments and grows our economy while maintaining high public safety and environmental protection standards. Yep. We must continue our ongoing efforts to support Ontario hardworking job creators and enhance our competitive advantages for the years to come. Speaker. Can the minister please elaborate on how our government is fueling future economic growth by modernizing Ontario's regulatory system? Member for Niagara West. Thank you to the member for Cambridge. And I know that the minister is leading the charge when it comes to cutting red tape, reducing costs for businesses, and ensuring that it's easier to start, operate, and expand a business, creating jobs and driving our economy forward. Now, since forming government under the leadership of the minister and this entire party, we've seen real progress. We've reduced Ontario's regulatory burden by 16,000 regulatory compliance requirements, wow. saving businesses some $700 million, not once, but every single year. In annual compliance costs. The results speak for themselves, Speaker. Over 85,000 new jobs in Ontario last year. 
and since we came to office, over 660,000 new jobs here in the province of Ontario. We know there's more work to do to clean up after 15 years of Liberal and NDP mismanagement, but we're going to get the job done under this Premier and under the leadership of each and every member of this House. We won't stop. Next question, the member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. Last week, a letter from a teacher warned that students and staff at Tompkin Road Middle School do not feel safe going to school. Tompkin Road is far from alone. Violence in our schools is reaching a crisis level. But instead of investing in mental health supports and additional staff, this government offers nothing but platitudes. In fact, school boards are being forced to cut safety monitors and child and youth workers. What will it take for the Premier to finally make the investments needed to keep students and workers in our schools safe? Of education. Mr. Speaker, there is absolutely nothing to dismiss about a 400% increase in mental health supports under our progressive Conservative government. There is nothing platitudinal. When the member from Burlington brings forth a motion calling on government to mandate mental health literacy in the grades 7, 8, and 10 curriculum, which we are doing for this coming September, we are taking action, not performative action, real action, investments, funding, staffing, and mandatory learning in the school system. This shouldn't be a political exercise for the NDP if we should be working together to further educate students on how they can see themselves as part of the solution on the day-to-day -day challenges of living a life in this country. We know that there are challenges of violence in schools. That's why we're increasing support. There's 3,000 more EAs helping those kids. There are 7,000 more Response. staff in our publicly funded schools. And this September, if the members opposite want to be supportive of those kids, vote for our budget that will add 2,000 more educators to Ontario School. Supplementary question. The minister can spin as hard as he wants. Students, staff, and parents can see with their own eyes that the supports are not there in our schools for our children when they need them. Every day, students with autism and disabilities are being excluded from our schools because the supports are not there to keep them safe at school. We did a survey to parents which shows only a small snapshot of the problem and shows that at least 78 kids with special needs missed out on more than 555 hours of school in just the past two weeks. Yep. Knowing the extent of the problem is the first step to fixing it. Will the government finally listen to parents like the parents from the Ontario Autism Coalition and finally track and publicly report on all exclusions in our schools? Yeah. Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, our government brought forth Bill 98, the uh, Better Schools and Student Outcomes Act, specifically designed to increase transparency for parents in Ontario. Because we provide 125, I mean, the member from Edmonton Lawrence speaks so passionately about this issue, 125 million more dollars in specific spec ed. And parents want to know where do those dollars go, and they have a right to know. We're going to ensure more transparency. There are 3,000 more education assistants hired by our government under our Premier's leadership. We, too, want to make sure that there's value for those investments and for that staffing. Mr. Speaker, we added a 400 per cent increase in mental health. We're spending more in special education than any government. But, Mr. Speaker, the virtue is not just spending more. It's getting more out of the system for the kids we represent. And we're going to stand up for better outcomes, more Response. accountability, and a better school experience for children in Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility. May 28 marked the start of National Accessibility Awareness Week. This is an opportunity for us to raise awareness about the importance of accessibility and to show our support for Ontario's, Ontarians with accessibility needs. We also celebrate community leaders and advocate with disability who are working to build a more inclusive society. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is promoting National Accessibility Awareness Week? Minister of Seniors and Accessibility. Thank you, the MPP Scarborough Centre, for asking the very important question. National Accessibility Awareness Week is very important to this government 
and to me personally. Thanks to the leadership of the Minister of Labor, we are announcing over $4 million wow. the skills development fund this week. Wow. This marvelous fund will support local organizations like the Canadian National Institute for the Blind and the Geneva Autism Center. They make sure people with disabilities have the right programs and services to find meaningful training and jobs. Response. Join us in celebrating those who are making this province more accessible and inclusive for everyone. Beautiful. Supplementary question. Every person in Ontario deserves inclusion and accessibility. It is great to see that our government is committed to raising awareness about the needs to improve accessibility. But there is more that needs to be done to remove barriers in every community across Ontario to make the life easier for people with disability. Our government must continue to move ahead with projects that will make accessibility a part of everyday life. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please explain what our government is doing to make Ontario more accessible? Mr. Seniors and Accessibility. Speaker, there's no better advocate for accessibility than this Premier. He understands the accessibility and inclusion requires a long-term vision. Every dollar we spend on infrastructure is a dollar being invested for people with disabilities. <clears throat> Every dollar of history, $60 billion investment into transit is being invested for people with disabilities. Every dollar that the Premier and this government is spending on building Ontario is a dollar spent on making the province more accessible. Mr. Speaker, Response. project by project, community by community, we are making Ontario more <laughs> accessible every day. Thank you. The next question, the member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last week at a private for-profit long-term care home in Arroyo, a resident who lives with a disability was forced to sit in their own waist for an entire night due to staffing shortages at the home. Staff was unable to assist the resident because they didn't have any staff. And according to the resident, it's not the first time this has happened. Speaker, when is this government going to put forward a actual plan to address the staffing crisis in long-term care and ensure that residents our seniors, our parents, our grandparents are treated with the dignity and respect they deserve. Here, here. To reply, the government house, house leader and, and minister of long-term care. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question. Uh, the member is quite correct. Uh, I was uh, uh, very unhappy by what uh, by what I uh, heard uh, last week. Uh, uh, the two instances uh, of uh, that I'm unhappy. I've been unhappy with. In one instance, of course, there was an air conditioning uh, uh, challenge in one of our homes. Uh, the the municipal home in that case has been fined uh, $25,000 under new uh, rules that we brought into place. And in the other instance, uh, again, uh, equally uh, unacceptable, Mr. Speaker. I've asked uh, the uh, inspections branch to immediately uh, go into the home, uh, investigate. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, directly to the member's uh, question, we are adding uh, four hours of care a day uh, uh, per, per resident. This will be a North American leading standard. At the same time, we're at, adding an additional 27,000 health care workers to meet that standard. We started uh, uh, on doing that uh, a couple of years ago, and the Minister, of course, of uh, uh, Colleges and Universities has a, a program that has been leading to thousands of people getting back into uh, into the sector, Mr. Speaker. So I've been very excited Spons. about that. We've also met our targets uh, uh, as we've been increasing the level of care. We've met our targets over the last two years, so we do have a plan in place. Of course, the member opposite voted against that plan. He voted against extra staffing in his own riding, Mr. Speaker, but we'll get it done, don't worry. Thank you. <laughs> 
I appreciate the, uh, the response, uh, but I will say if you repeal Bill 124, that will certainly help with your staffing. This is not the first incident of this kind in a private for profit long term care home in the province of Ontario. We learned recently that this government is going to fast track the expansion of Ultra Villa, a private for profit home where the military had to be step in during COVID, where re residents were left with spoiled diapers, rooms were overrun by bugs, where some seniors died due to dehydration. And we know during COVID, the vast majority of deaths happened in private for-profit homes. When is this minister and this government going to stand up to the private long-term care companies and say, enough is enough? Thank you. Mr. Long-Term Care. In fact, this government stood up on behalf of all residents in long-term care and passed the, hallmark, uh, the landmark Fixing Long-Term Care Act, which the member voted against. What does that include? It includes, Mr. Speaker, a guarantee of four hours of care. It includes a bill of rights for, uh, uh, for the residents in our long-term care homes. They voted against that, uh, Speaker. I've already said we're increasing uh, staffing to four hours uh, a day. And North American leading standing. We're building 60,000 uh, new long-term care homes. I know the opposition is just ideologically opposed to anything that has to do with private individuals having any role to play in any part of society. We've talked about this before. The only thing that they care about is ensuring that people are dependent exclusively on government. We view things differently, Mr. Speaker. We want to give people the resources and Response. the tools to succeed. He talks about Orchard Villa. He talks about Southbridge. I am happy to report that they received their Canada accreditation to being one of the best long-term care homes in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Next question, member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Speaker, everyone in Ontario deserves the highest standard of mental health and addictions care. There is no health without mental health, which is why our government must continue to make investments to support Indigenous-led initiatives that are tailored to meet the needs of their communities. Our government must remain committed to building an Ontario where everyone is fully supported in their journey towards mental wellness. This includes working with Indigenous partners and communities to improve access to mental health, addictions and well-being services. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain what measures our government is implementing to make these vital services available in Indigenous communities? To reply, the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Hastings, Lennox, and Eddington for this important question. Ensuring that the services we provide are culturally safe and culturally appropriate is an extremely important part of building a continuum of care that works for everyone in Ontario. Indigenous leaders have consistently told me nothing about us without us. Recently, I had the honour of attending the Kenora Chiefs Advisory Mental Wellness Summit where I heard directly from Northern Indigenous communities about their needs. I'm proud to say that after working with community leaders, we've developed land-based healing, detox and aftercare programs with Kasheshwan, Tequa Tegamu First Nation and Mishkegawak Tribal Council, with more to come. Across the North, we're making investments to build capacity, aid in crisis response and support local community members and frontline healthcare workers in First Nations communities. Speaker, our government's investments are building out the culturally safe services that are critical response. to ensuring that Ontario, no one goes without the support they need. Thank you. Concludes our question period for this morning.